so Sasha, I think it's a good chance to introduce yourself. Obviously, I've told people that you're coming in and what you're going to talk about a little bit. But yeah, let's start with uh, who you are, a bit about Crowdcube in case anyone doesn't know and, and go from yeah. here. Yeah, of course. Uh, so my name's Sasha. Uh, I am one of the equity fundraising managers at Crowdcube. So I work very much at the front of our kind of funnel, talking to entrepreneurs and talking to um, investors, predominantly to the entrepreneur side and sort of getting them educated on what crowdfunding is, whether it would be right for them, whether it's now or maybe slightly further down the line. And yeah, just kind of helping entrepreneurs really as much as we can. Um, obviously, as a business, we're, we're fairly well connected. Um, and as an individual, I've become slightly more connected. Uh, so I hope to help entrepreneurs in, in more ways than just fundraising, I hope. Um, Crowdcube is a business. We are the world's leading equity crowdfunding platform, uh, as well as the oldest. So we were founded about a decade ago now. Um, we've raised just over 650 million pounds for around 950 startups. Um, we've worked with businesses like Monzo and Brewdog, uh, we've actually funded 19% of the UK's uniforms so far, uh, with a couple more coming coming into that space, which is really exciting. And yeah, we've we work with all sectors and all shapes and sizes. So we work with kind of pre-revenue, pre-launch businesses raising their first 50k, all the way up to Monzo, who raised 20 million uh, in about three hours. Um, so we really do see the world of his life at Crowdcube, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, today hopefully we'll just kind of give you a backstory on, on what's kind of happening in our the fundraising world. I'm quite lucky, aside from working at Crowdcube, my father is an angel investor and my older brother is an investment banker. So as you can imagine, Sunday lunch conversations, very fun. <laughs> <laughs> my mom just looks at us like, why, 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 all of you, why? <laughs> um, so hopefully I can shed a bit of light having had a bit of contact from from both of them about what's going on in their spaces so yeah hopefully it will be useful <laughs> cool so if any anyone's got any questions i've got some set questions and things we'll go through with sasha as a bit of a talk but if anyone's got any questions along the way please dm them into the group chat and then we can pick them up and things as we go as well so sasha i was listening last night to startup man and anthony rose talking on startup man I thought it's quite interesting. Um, obviously, he's saying that uh, C Legals are doing absolutely amazingly well. They've had no decline in the number of people who are coming on and raising rounds, and they've closed 20% of rounds in the last week that were on the platform, uh, or 20% growth in round closure. How, how realistic do you think that is from your perception <laughs> of what's happening in crowdfunding? Uh I mean, if <laughs> we, we've actually, I mean, having spoken to, again, friends across VC, angels, wider, any entrepreneur in general can probably smell a bit of bullshit with that. And if, as my father would generally say, if it smells like bullshit, it probably is. Fundraising minute is difficult and it's more difficult than it ever has been. Uh, well, certainly in the last couple of years. And I think this, there's, certainly a story from from C legals and a couple of other fundraising platforms it's better than ever and i think it's again it's the, the data is a bit clouded you, you know C legals do a lot of preemption rounds so rounds of businesses who've got existing shareholders they kind of they close they can close them in a week so it's a slightly different perception especially on if you're looking seed or, or much bigger rounds C legals are kind of their sweet spot is you know clues in the name is seed rounds kind of just after your first round second round where you've got your kind of your, your first investors looking to get you through um funding rounds that i've just had a question funding rounds that are still happening are they smaller generally yes um but there's you know i suppose there's still scope for them to grow they're starting off a lot smaller yes but what we're seeing is that there's still potential for a lot of them to do really well if they come in with that right momentum and things like that um yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of the data, I think it certainly seems a bit, um, it certainly seems a bit skewed. Some people are coming out with data that looks very hot, but it's probably not allaying the whole truth. Yeah, I can imagine. And have you, have you seen, I'm going to come back in a second to Francois and, and Wyndham. Have you seen yeah. a massive increase in the type of businesses that are coming through for fundraising in sort of like maybe the ed tech sector or, um, 
uh, sort of remote work engagement tools and are, in, and, and are investors looking for these as well? Because the sense I got, at least from Anthony Rose, was he was saying that this is where it's coming from. But I was wondering, are people really flooding into to this area at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I suppose the, the types that we're seeing and the, and the, the businesses that we're seeing is, is quite a mix. Um, on the side of like the, effectively the COVID winners in all of this, um, we are seeing quite a lot of them come through looking kind of for short term capital to, to help this growth and, and things like that and take, take advantage of that. So med tech in particular is we're seeing a lot of kind of inbound from, from that kind of space. Um, that being said, I suppose when it comes to crowdfunding, again, the clue's kind of in the name, it is still about having a crowd. And interestingly, businesses which have quite chunky consumer bases or, or really supportive networks, so if it's geared around, you've got really supportive friends and family, you've got really supportive wider networks and that, so you know, people within a second degree of connection are really supportive. Those types of businesses we're seeing quite a lot of as well. So cafes, restaurants, and bars that are kind of struggling at the moment, some of these breweries, um, equally a lot within um, kind of entertainment and media uh, on the big event side and also travel. A lot of the travel businesses who are, who are having a bit of a tough time at the moment, who've got really loyal fan bases and really, really high engagement rates in general. That group is doing well at crowdfunding and they're doing well in fundraising in general because what you know what I've spoken to a lot of my kind of VC contacts about what they're looking for right now and what investors are looking for right now are recession proof businesses then they're, they're not too bothered about the sector okay digital businesses in general kind you know that trend has been going on for the last kind of year two years anyway but they're looking for businesses where they have got really strong engagement rates and if you're a restaurant, cafe and bar, and then you pivot to doing home delivery right now, they want to see that engagement rate still really, really high. For them, it's kind of demonstrative that you've got a really loyal, really sticky fan base. Because what we're seeing at the moment in this kind of, this kind of era at the moment is what we're calling the magpie generation. We've got a group of millennials who find it so easy to switch between different services why should they stay with you and if they are staying with you it's a massive sign to investors that you've got the sweet spot and got that stickiness so yeah. for us at the moment we're we're really kind of I think the, bar, the businesses that are doing well and the businesses that we're kind of appealing to at the moment are the ones where we know they've got that really engaged consumer base and if that's a restaurant that's pivoted if that's a a travel business that pivoted and they're seeing high engagement rates in different areas than they did previously that's kind of showing to us the recession proof that they're, they're built to last effectively. And that's kind of what we're after as our kind of investors more generally. Super. Um, I saw a question from Wyndham about government small business loans. Um, and I yeah. wonder how much view you have of this, but I'm interested to hear if you do. And then I definitely have a view myself a little bit. But. Yeah, definitely. So in, when it comes to the government loans, interesting, this is something that's been taken up by one of our co-founders, Luke Lang. He is spearheading a, a campaign to petition the government to change the rules around these startup government loans. Because at the moment, they don't really apply to the majority of startups because the, as much as you know, they're telling the banks to be more flexible, et cetera, the, the, the requirements to get these loans haven't really changed. So you have to be a profitable business is, is the biggest challenge, which is, you know, startups it's not it's not something that's reality yet and so we've got luke alongside some of our our partners kind of campaigning the government so if you haven't seen the petition already please sign it um we're really petitioning hard to try and get the government to change the way that this these loans are working so that it is accessible to to startups um you know we've seen similar support coming out of the french and the, and the german governments it's something that we're really looking to get ahead of uh, to get as well in the UK because you know we we are the kind of center of startup ecosystem at the moment it's something we want to continue post covid as well so it's something which i think is a it's it's they're not really right for most startups at the moment but it's something that we are looking to change that's brilliant i'm trying to find the link actually sasha online i can't find let it let me 
you i will find it uh save our stuff so yeah i i was going to comment very similar to uh, i mean where we definitely count as a startup we wouldn't qualify for one of the startup loans i looked at them at the beginning i thought it was a very interesting opportunity with such low interest rates for a sort of six month period by which i more than hope to be out of the situation we're in and back into a more normal operation um, so I was looking at it as a business, but I believe we don't qualify either as a business. So I think they're more tailored to people who are and not in that startup world who are sort of profit and uh, revenue generating such... substantial revenue. I also heard the banks are not giving it out very easily at the moment either. So, um, so yeah. yeah, it's the, the biggest problem is they've got money in the bank, so to speak, but they, they just not change those requirements for what, how a business can apply. And it's just, there's, it hasn't been thought through enough, um, but yeah, hopefully, what I'm, what I'm hearing from the top is things are on the move. So, yeah. fingers crossed. It would be interesting, seeing as we all bailed the banks out in 2008, I, I'm hearing the message now that it's their turn to bail the rest of us back out. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> I think that sounds fair enough. Um, Francois, you asked a question about travel startup. So, if someone's a travel startup, yeah. obviously, Sasha is talking about people who are very engaged already. So, they, I guess, have one journey. What if you're right at the beginning? Do you do you just shut up shop at the moment, or what would you recommend to someone like this if they came to yeah, you? Yeah, I think when it comes to really early stage businesses that haven't necessarily got a lot of um, maybe not not really got a, a big community that they can go out to, they can rely on at this point. I suppose there's a, there's a couple of different things that I would recommend. I suppose depending on how many overheads you are, you have. I keep the overheads, keep costs down as, as much as you can. I mean, that is relevant to all startups at the moment, but I think particularly for travel, if you can cut that as much as you can and focus on coming out the other side of it. So whether that, you know, with your own personal kind of knowledge and experience piling into, okay, marketing plans for the latter half of the year for winter sales, et cetera, or looking at things like, you know, how can I develop the, the UX or the website, things like that. So when you are ready to get up and going again, that you're coming out stronger the other side. So, you know, you don't need to be in an office with other people if you're focusing on the UX development. You can put your headphones on and really crack into that. I think that puts you in a really good place for when this all ends. So if you're at that kind of stage and, and you've got that knowledge and you've got that experience where you can kind of really pile into something and really develop, you know, again, business, business models, marketing plans, really kind of getting the structure down so that you're ready to attack this when this all ends is quite a good way. You'll, you'll be ready for that kind of take off. That said, if you are, if you really need fundraising, you need, you need to get people on board to help you and you need to pay agencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I think it is worth looking at your network and, and seeing what potential capital you could get from that group. When I'm talking to very early stage startups, so many of them at the moment are, you know, are looking for angel financing, are looking for, for, for private investors. And, you know, that group is taking longer to decide and, and they're reducing the size of their investments. And actually, you know, the best way to find funders is within your own network. So, a part, whether you fundraise right now, whether it's later down the line, I'd say focus on your mapping out your network for a bit. So what I mean by that is if you went into the funding round right now, could you name your first 100 investors? Most likely those first 100 in any case are probably going to come out of your network anyway. So you need to understand who they could actually be. So I spend a lot of time doing workshops with female founders. And one of the first things that I get people to do in my workshops is to draw a little bit like when you're at school, a mind map of you and the business, and then have lots of strings coming off of the different groups you're connected to. So you've got family, another group, family, friends, another friends, partners, suppliers, ex-colleagues, current colleagues. Put all of those little circles and start really understanding where there is capital. You know, I know my brother and my and my father are well connected, fairly deep pocketed friends kind of network. So I'm like, right, if I could get each of them to introduce me to five people, what's possible? Further to that, I think getting involved with a community that could potentially be your 
your community could be your fans start building really strong relationships with them online so if you're a travel brand start going voyager hq start following them on on linkedin and on twitter they are a us a quite a big travel accelerator but they're coming into london increasingly more and they're running lots of digital seminars and webinars right now find your digital tribe find your digital your digital community start commenting on things lonely planet's got loads of articles out right now comment on things message on forums add to blogs offer your services known in the space so by the time you are looking for financing by the time you are starting to you know build out your product and, and go out to the market whenever this is finished or, or before then you've got a group to go out to so really spend time i think focusing on as i say mapping out your network and then building it out with your with digital communities so I think that's going to put you in a really good stead for when this when this all ends Thank you, Sasha. I think that's really, really good advice. When I fundraised, I did not stop talking about our fundraise and what we're doing as a business. If you asked me a question on how I was doing, you heard about my fundraise. And by the end of it, I would ideally know if you knew someone else who yeah. potentially invested in other businesses and had their email. And yeah. um, we took investment from my neighbor, asked me how I was doing on the way home. He then turned out, he introduced me to someone who manages a high net worth angel group. She actually invested herself within the group and we have potential follow on investment from the high net worth group. Yeah, I completely agree. Ex-colleagues is one I think people miss all the yeah. time and turns out so regularly to be a source of people. These people worked alongside you. Anyone trust that you can launch and run a business? It should be someone who's worked alongside you. And if, if they don't, then... Um, then there'll be someone somewhere in that network. We've all had colleagues who we've got along with and things over the time. So yeah, I think that's really, Definitely. really Definitely. And I, and I think, you know, I, you know, classify them in different buckets as well. So some of those ex colleagues probably will not be investing minimum ticket sizes of 10 grand, but they probably could invest maybe a grand. So how do you get that grand out of them? And if you add up those grands each time, you've got a hundred people giving you a grand each. You're getting some movement. You're getting some traction there. So don't don't write off the person who you can put in a thousand pounds. They're valuable as much as you know every that ten thousand pound investor. So just kind of I don't think necessarily think about just the high ticket people, but the people who could actually commit to that amount. If they can hard commit to a brand, definitely keep warm, keep them warm, keep talking to them, keep them up to up speed. They will be valuable at some point. Thank you, Sasha. So we've overrun a little bit. So thank you so much for staying with us for a little bit longer, but I think it's a very interesting topic.